When we think about the causes of inflation, we want to go back to how prices and wages are determined. And so remember that in uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7, we looked at uh, both how firms determine their prices and how uh, the interaction between firms and workers determine workers' wages. So firms will increase prices uh, when they believe it is in their profit maximizing interest and uh, workers will uh, bargain for the highest wage that they can uh, which will depend on things like the unemployment rate. So inflation may have a number of causes which we'll look at in a little more detail in just a second. It could be increases in bargaining power of firms um, over their customers. So if there's a reduction in competition that allows them to increase their markup, that can increase inflation. Uh, or it could be increases in the bargaining power of workers over firms, uh, either due to uh, higher bargaining power of employment, so increased unions, or just an increased um, macroeconomic situation, so a lower unemployment rate. So if we think about these sort of uh, in turn, if owners uh, have less competition in their product markets, then the profit curve shifts down, right? Their markup increases. That means that we see higher prices and therefore higher inflation overall. It could be that employees' power rises relative to owners, for instance, if there's uh, stronger unions, um, and that would shift the wage curve up and lead to uh, higher costs for firms and therefore higher prices and therefore higher inflation. Or it could be that employees' power rises relative to uh, owners in the short run, right, in the business cycle. And so if we move up along the wage setting curve because of a lower unemployment rate during an expansion, uh, then we'll have a lower unemployment rate and we'll have higher wages, which will then get transferred into higher prices. Remember that firms' major cost is wages. So when wages go up, prices are going to tend to go up as well. So back in the 1950s, there was an economist named uh, A.W. Phillips, and he looked at data going back to the 19th century uh, in the UK countries. And he found that there was an inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. And so he plotted this. Note that in this textbook, they when they're plotting the unemployment rate, in order to fit it into our employment model, they plot it backwards. So that zero unemployment is over here on the right-hand side, and higher unemployment is over here on the left-hand side. And so we get an upward sloping line instead of a downward sloping line. So how might higher employment lead to inflation? Well, lower unemployment rate means it's harder to find workers. So firms have uh, a worse bargaining position, and workers have a better bargaining position. That leads to higher wages. That means that costs for firms are higher. That means that given their markup, that leads to higher prices. And so this was sort of an observation by Phillips uh, in the 1950s, uh, but it seemed to hold true at the time. Um, and it makes sense in our aggregate demand model. So if we think about what's going on, then higher aggregate demand leads to more employment, right? Firms are producing more, so they need more workers. That means they need to pay higher wages. That leads to higher cost of production and therefore, given a fixed markup, higher prices. Uh, that leads to price, price and wage inflation, but the real wage is not increased. Why? Because if your wage goes up by 5%, but the price level goes up by 5%, then your real wage hasn't gone up. Now, keep in mind that that will somewhat depend on whether you are a net borrower or a net saver, right? We said that higher unexpected inflation helps borrowers by decreasing the value of their debt, but hurts lenders. Um, the constant real wage means that employment stays high, but that inflation can keep going up and up. So if we think about this sort of over the course of the business cycle, um, that if there is unemployment below the equilibrium, so if we're over here at point B instead of point A, then we'll have upward pressure on wages and prices, right? So we would expect higher inflation and higher wage growth during expansions when the unemployment rate is very low, but the opposite will be the case when uh, we're in a recession. So if we're over here at point C, 
then we would expect downward pressure on wages and prices. And so we would expect uh, lower inflation and perhaps even negative inflation, right? Deflation. At point A, right, that's where we're in equilibrium in our employment model. And so that is where we would expect zero inflation. Now, this is basically what Phillips' original curve said, was that when we're at equilibrium, we have zero inflation. But we've already seen that we don't actually usually have zero inflation. And so we're going to come back to that and say why uh, we don't have zero inflation very often these days. The way we can think of this is as a bargaining gap, right? And so if we are at a place where uh, the unemployment rate is really low, then there's going to be a positive bargaining gap. Positive bargaining gap means higher wages, which means higher inflation. On the other hand, if unemployment is above the equilibrium, then we'll have a negative bargaining gap, right? Workers will be in a worse position. And so that will lead to uh, lower wages and deflation. And the labor market equilibrium is when that bargaining gap is zero and we're at point A in the previous slide. So that means that we have a number of different ways that we can understand inflation, right? Inflation is defined as the increase in prices, but increase in prices will depend on the increase in costs for firms. So if, if costs are going up per unit of output, then that could be due to an increase in wages, right? Especially if wages are the only cost. We know they're not, but they are still, of course, one of the more important uh, pieces of cost. And that will depend on the bargaining gap, right? So if there is a positive bargaining gap because of a lower unemployment rate, that will lead to higher in wages, higher inflation. If there's a negative bargaining gap, that will lead to lower wages and lower inflation. So we can also think of this in terms of our aggregate demand model. Right, where when we have uh, high aggregate demand at point B, that's when we have a positive bargaining gap. That's when our Phillips curve, right, which is uh, upward sloping in this example because it's um, measuring employment instead of unemployment, uh, that leads to higher inflation. And when we have a negative bargaining gap in a recession, like at point C, that leads to deflation. And so that's really what Phillips saw. He saw years of deflation during recessions, and years of inflation uh, during expansion. The way we want to think about this is sort of the difference between the medium run and the short run, right? Our aggregate demand equilibrium, where output is equal to aggregate demand, will be the same as our labor market equilibrium, where we have zero inflation. But in the short run, we might not be at equilibrium. And so we could have a higher aggregate demand, which leads to a positive bargaining gap and positive inflation. Or in a recession, we could have a low aggregate demand, which leads to a negative bargaining gap and deflation.